When it comes to nuclear energy, Canada has always been an innovator. This goes all the way back to 1952 with the development of the world-renowned Kandu reactor. 70 years later, with the renewed interest in nuclear as an alternative energy source to fossil fuels, Canada is leading the charge once again. On this episode, we talk about the future of nuclear energy, small modular reactors. Welcome to a new episode of Simply Science, the podcast that talks about the amazing scientific work that our experts in Natural Resources Canada are doing. My name is Joel Houle, and joining me is my co-host, Barb Ustina. Barb, how are you? I'm doing just great today. How are you doing, Joelle? I'm okay. I'm okay. I'm really excited about today's episode. I interviewed our guest a few years ago, and I learned so much about nuclear energy, so I'm really excited. Yeah, well, what, what stood out to you at the time? Well, one thing actually is the um, the percentage of Ontario's electricity generation mix. It's at 60% or around 60%. And I'm like, well, that's significant. You know, being from Ottawa, I wasn't aware that, you know, over half our, uh, our energy actually comes from nuclear. So that was kind of surprising to me. Yeah, I bet there are a lot of people who wouldn't expect that much energy to come from nuclear in Ontario. Yeah, definitely. You know, it's, it's, I'm, I'm surprised by that, too. So, mm-hmm. you know, that, that's one of the things I did to prepare for this podcast uh, today was uh, I went back and I listened to that podcast that you did um, back then. And uh, I think he called it the forgotten energy source at the yeah, time. Yeah, forgotten and clean energy. I, yeah, I think. Yeah, yeah. And I think you're right. It has been, you know, the idea of nuclear energy has sort of been left behind for a few years. It has people haven't really talked about it, you know, maybe even for decades. Um so it's interesting now to see the renewed interest um, in nuclear energy and especially the way it's being discussed around climate change and clean energy use. And of course, there is a lot to talk about when it comes to nuclear energy. Oh, definitely. And I'm really interested in this new small modular reactor technology. Well, you know what? I don't think we should delay it anymore. Should we just go and uh, bring in our guests? Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm really interested to do like a bit of a deeper dive into nuclear energy and the small modular reactors. You know, what are they all about? Exactly. Okay, you know what? Let's do this. We have a returning guest today. We're really excited to welcome back Deanne Cameron from Natural Resources Canada's Nuclear Energy Division. She was one of our, our very first guests on the podcast. So last time she was here, we talked about nuclear uh, energy as a whole. And today what we're going to do is we're going to talk about small modular reactors. Deanne, thank you for coming back. Oh, it's great to be here. Yeah, you know, I was just listening to that early podcast this afternoon and, and really it's such an interesting topic. And I'm glad that you're able to make it back. Um, but before we dive into it too deep, uh, would you mind giving us a quick overview of where things are at with nuclear energy in Canada? You know, like how many power plants there are, where they're located, how much power we get from nuclear, that sort of thing? Absolutely. Um, nuclear is a pretty important part of our clean electricity grid in Canada. Nuclear currently provides about 15% of the electricity across the nation. Now, that's mainly in Ontario, where we have 18 power reactors. They're all can-do technologies, homegrown can-do nuclear technologies, and they provide in the province of Ontario over 60% of the electricity for the whole province. In New Brunswick, there's another power reactor, another can-do at Point Le Pro, and it provides over 35% of the electricity for the province of New Brunswick. In addition to power, though, in addition to clean electricity, we also have uranium mining in Canada, concentrated in northern Saskatchewan. And the uranium that we mine in Saskatchewan is used not only to power the reactors in Canada, but also we're the second largest exporter of uranium to the, to the world market. Um, another interesting thing that a lot of people don't know is about medical isotopes. can reactors in Canada One of the products that they produce is called a radioisotope. And these are things that are used in nuclear medicine in the treatment of the detection and the treatment of cancers, different types of cancers. Medical isotopes, in particular, one that's called cobalt 60, 
is also used in the sterilization of medical equipment. And so throughout the pandemic, we were really reminded about the important role that nuclear energy plays in the lives of Canadians. Not only did we keep our nuclear reactors running, and that was so important for keeping the lights on in homes and hospitals across the nation, but also we continued to produce cobalt-60, and we supplied 40% of the world's cobalt-60 that was used to sterilize once through medical equipment, like PPE, gloves and gowns and masks which we also very much needed during the pandemic. Wow. Well, well, it's I guess it's timely as well that we're talking about this today. So one of the, the things that I'm hearing is that there's this movement in the industry where small modular reactors or SMRs are said to be the future of nuclear energy. Can you please explain what those are? For sure. So a small modular reactor is technically defined to be any nuclear reactor that is smaller than 300 megawatts electric. But just to put that in perspective and give you a sense of that size, um, the CANDU reactors that I talked about before, those are what we call gigawatt scale reactors. Each one of the CANDU reactors produces on the order of 1,000 megawatts of electricity per unit. And so an SMR, or a small modular reactor, is anything that's sort of less than a third the size of a can-do. Now, small modular reactors are not just smaller in terms of their power output, they're also smaller in terms of their physical footprint and their land use. They're modular, um, which is a bit different too. Modular here means two things. It means they're intended to be factory produced and manufactured, kind of like the way we manufacture cars on a production line. And so these modular modular components would be manufactured um, in, uh, and we would derive. Uh, the idea is that that by doing the manufacturing that way, you can drive down the cost and um, and improve the economics of nuclear. So they're smaller, they're modular, and they're still reactors. So that means that somewhere in the middle of the SMR is a nuclear fission reaction that is generating heat, and that heat can be used directly as process heat. Uh, for heavy industry applications like SAG-D or, uh, or, or other industrial processes that need high temperature heat or high quality steam. The heat can also be used directly for uh, mine shaft heating or district heating, for desalination, for hydrogen production. The heat is really valuable, but of course the heat can also be used always to drive a turbine and generate electricity. So that's really what we mean by SMRs. I'll just come back on the size just quickly. I said it was anything less than 300 megawatts electric, but that's still a pretty big range from zero to 300. And really what we're seeing is the emergence of sort of different subsectors within SMR or different uh, sub-applications within SMR. At the large end, that 300 megawatt electric size, those are what we're calling grid scale. The main purpose of those units is to generate electricity on a grid to produce non-emitting power to a grid. And one of the provinces that's interested in SMRs for this purpose is Saskatchewan, where they have a lot of coal that they need to get offline by 2030 um, to meet our climate change objectives. Um, But at the other end of the spectrum, the very small modular reactors, down around 5 megawatts electric, these are, some people call them micro-reactors. They're intended to be um, deployed uh, off-grid. They're intended to be a little bit more mobile. And they have applications, for example, in off-grid mining, where mines are looking to find an alternative to diesel, which is expensive, logistically complicated, emitting, not only in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, but also in terms of local air pollution. So there really is, even within the SMR envelope, a range of different sizes and different applications. Now, I'm just curious, um, are there any small uh, modular reactors at work in Canada right now, or is this totally new technology? So that's a really interesting question. So right now in Canada, we have some research reactors. For example, at the McMaster campus in Hamilton, there's a small research reactor that's about five megawatts. And so it is a small reactor, but it's not It's not what one would normally think of when we think of small modular reactor because it wasn't sort of factory produced, right? It was a research reactor, kind of a one-off. 
But of course, our experience with small reactors helps us as we try to get into SMRs. So the other point of comparison that I would put out there is that there are countries around the world that have been operating nuclear submarines and nuclear icebreakers for decades and decades. Now, those are also not exactly the same thing, but they are small nuclear. And so the the exercise of um, innovation to create small modular reactors is really about engineers and scientists and industry working together to try to take the, the pieces that we know how to do and bring them together in a new way. So I would say that almost every SMR technology that people are working on developing has components that are well understood and well established that have either been used in research settings or have been used in nuclear submarines or nuclear icebreakers or they've been used by NASA or you know, they've been used in different ways. And so there's there's some newness to it, um, but mostly the newness of, is about bringing it together in a new way for a new application. Now, why do you suppose uh, there's renewed interest in uh, nuclear energy now sort of thing? It seems like it's popping up in all kinds of conversations in the media, public discourse. Well, I think a couple of things have happened. Uh, one of them is, of course, the imperative to address climate change and decarbonize our electricity supply and um, has forced some very um, difficult conversations about what are our real options in different jurisdictions. Some jurisdictions are blessed with different energy endowments that make it easier. Some are blessed or some are not blessed with those endowments and it makes it harder. And each jurisdiction sort of has to look at uh, at its options. And in many contexts, uh, nuclear is an excellent option uh, for when you're trying to decarbonize and establish a non-emitting grid. Uh, so that's one. Uh, another, also within the context of climate change, there are some traditionally very difficult to abate uh, industrial sectors that, re that need high temperature heat. And right now, the only real option for them uh, is cogeneration, or what we call combined heat and power, cogen from natural gas, um, which is uh, which which meets the needs for sure, but still has some emissions with it. And we are seeing some heavy industry uh, stakeholders starting to consider what might I be able to do instead of natural gas cogen if I wanted to reduce my emissions even further, um, where I could still get the high temperature heat. And the challenge is that it's very inefficient and very costly to create heat from electricity. It's much better because it's much better if you can create the heat that you need directly and then use your excess heat to create the electricity that you need. So in um so there have been so there are these industrial sectors that have been very difficult to uh to de to decarbonize and we call that deep decarbonization and the 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 priority on de decarbonization has been rising because, of course, when we started the exercise of decarbonizing, you know, not just here in Canada, but around the world, you start with the low hanging fruit. And eventually you have to get to even the difficult or hard to reach fruit. And that's when you have to start looking at all of your options very seriously. And I I believe that that's one of the reasons uh, that people have uh, have seen um, a renewed interest in nuclear technology. But I think there's another reason too, which is that uh, there have been some breakthroughs in nuclear innovation in recent years that have made some nuclear technologies more feasible than they had been in the past. So here, I'll just give you an example. Um, there is a, a type of SMR called a molten salt reactor, and it has all these really interesting uh, possible benefits. Um, uh, it, it's very efficient. Uh, it's theoretically, or at least on paper, very cost effective. It uh, can dynamically load, follow variable renewables. It can store heat. It can provide high temperature heat. It is. Uh, it has some very attractive simplified enhanced safety features uh, that would preclude the possibility of certain um, uh, types of accidents that could never happen. And um, but 
but the challenge and and these reactors have been these molten salt reactors have been um, researched and demonstrated in nuclear laboratories for decades. Uh, they were first conceived in the 1970s, but it was never possible to commercialize them because the salts were very corrosive. But breakthroughs in other sectors in material science in the last 10 to 15 years have all of a sudden made it possible um, for us to 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 look at uh, large scale commercial development of SMRs. And so it's been these breakthroughs where one piece of the puzzle maybe was missing and all the other pieces were there. And all of a sudden, this breakthrough gives you the last piece of the puzzle and something new is possible. And so I think it's the confluence of this wave of innovation um, and on the other side, the demand. Um, the, the public policy objectives around, um, around electrification, around deep decarbonization, um, and so in Canada, those are the main drivers, but around the world, there's also just the driver of uh, electricity uh, for economic development in many parts of the world, and nuclear is an excellent option for that for many, for many countries. So really, one of the um, factors that has prevented nuclear energy from being more prominent over the last few decades has been that stigma surrounding the uh, the safety of nuclear energy for for this new smr technology or this type of technology how safe is it for sure that's you know when when we engage with uh with the public there's always a couple of questions that are uh, top of mind and safety is one of them there have been nuclear accidents um, at Chernobyl and Fukushima that uh, people um, remember and, and it's top of mind and that's one of the first questions they ask. And we have, what I would say to that is that collectively as a global uh, community in Canada has been a part of this nuclear um, uh, group of nations that have this civil nuclear technical capability and um, we have accrued 60, 70 years of experience uh, with sort of that first generation of technologies. And we have learned a lot. Now, uh, that, has, um, that has trickled into uh, the, the innovation space. So now what we're seeing is this wave of innovation around SMRs that are being sort of rethought and the idea is to take all the lessons learned and and dramatically simplify and by simplifying um, enhance the safety of these units. So without getting into too many of the technical details, um, there are certain and, and different SMRs are seeking to achieve this in different ways. But there are certain design features that are being built into these SMRs um, to create this in enhanced safety. Some people call it walkaway safety. Some people call it passive safety. The idea in many cases is that you use the laws of physics to your favor. You don't try to work against them. And you design a reactor such that if something, if something shocks the system, if there's an earthquake or if there's a tsunami or if something happens, um, you literally walk away, hands off the reactor, and the laws of physics will drive it to zero. And so now these have, these have to be proven and they have to be um, demonstrated to the regulator uh, for to, so that we are assured that they do what they claim to be doing. But what I can tell you is that the motivation of the scientists and the engineers in designing these this next generation of SMRs is to take the lessons learned from the last 60, 70 years and rethink how we, uh, how we do safety in nuclear design. Now, I assume these SMRs uh, produce waste. Um, how much waste do they produce and how, how would it be handled? Yes, um, they do produce waste. In some cases, these reactors, like I was talking about the five megawatt units, they're very small. And so the first thing to know is that they produce a very small quantity of waste um, by comparison to a gigawatt scale reactor. Um, but even with our gigawatt scale reactors, um, it's a much smaller volume than most most people know. In Canada, we've been operating nuclear reactors 
uh, for over 60 years. And in that time, the amount of waste we have accumulated is the equivalent of seven hockey rinks filled to the boards. So that's really, when you think of it in that sense, it's quite a manageable volume. Like it's not sort of this insurmountable technical problem. Um, in Canada, we have a polluter pays principle for nuclear waste. And that is going to apply universally, whether it's a can-do or whether it's an SMR. If you are the producer of nuclear waste because you operate an SMR or a can-do, then you own the waste that that, that generates and you are responsible for the long-term safe management and the liability associated with that. Um, we have in Canada a very clear legislative uh, framework for this. And... Um, uh, today, all radioactive waste is safely managed according to international standards at facilities that are licensed and monitored by the CNSC, which is our, our world-class regulator, the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission. And we have another organization called the Nuclear Waste Management Organization, which is working on developing Canada's deep geological repository, which will be the ultimate destination for the long-term disposal of all radioactive waste in Canada, all high-level radioactive waste in Canada. And that will apply equally to SMRs as it does to can-do reactors. Having said all of that, many of the um, SMRs that we're, that we're looking at, again, that, that idea of having you know learned from 60 years of experience, there are different ways, and again, without getting too technical, there are different ways for the designers to sort of configure and design the SMR, and it produces kind of a different, um, a different type of waste, uh, characterized sort of with different characteristics. And so there is definitely a lot of thinking being done around how can we do an SMR that will create a type of waste that is easier or a lower quantity of it. Um, and so that's really interesting. And possibly the most interesting thing that I think the, the listeners might be really uh, keen to hear is that there are a couple of designs that are being looked at in Canada where the SMR actually has the potential to recycle can-do waste. So just like when you have a, an aluminum can and you finish drinking your, uh, your soda pop, um, you're, that technically is waste. Now that is waste, and you can either throw it in the landfill or you could recycle it and create something useful and new out of it. The same concept is true. The, way, the stuff that we call waste, um, it still has an enormous amount of energy in it. And so we have can-do waste that we are safely managing, but it still has a lot of energy in it. And there's a couple of SMRs that we're looking at that would actually take that waste and recycle it and take the old waste and create new useful SMR fuel and then use the SMR fuel to generate new electricity. And by doing that recycling and closing the, they call it closing the fuel cycle or that circular economy concept, and we would ultimately minimize and reduce the amount of waste for the, that would require that long-term deep geological repository. So we have this movement that's moving towards SMR. What are we doing here at Natural Resources Canada to support this movement? How are we involved? Well, um, we are um, we are convening um, sort of pan Canadian initiative. Now we already did our policy homework uh, in 2018, and um, maybe I'll just take a step back and say, uh, you know, I started this job uh, as director of nuclear energy in 2014, and when I started this job. Not very many people were talking about SMRs. Some scientists and researchers at the labs, but it wasn't sort of a main topic of conversation in the nuclear sector. And I would periodically ask the senior engineer on my team, SMRs, are they real? Are they going to happen? How far away are they? And when I first asked that question in 2014, um, the answer, I think, was, oh, they're at least 35 years away. And then a year later, I'd ask the question again, and all of a sudden, they were only 30 years away. And then a year later, I'd ask again, and all of a sudden, they're only 20 years away. And so, and, and more and more people were talking and working on, talking about and working on SMRs in Canada and around the world. And so there was clearly, it was accelerating, and there was more and more enthusiasm and momentum as different pieces of the puzzle were being brought together. And all of a sudden, different, part, you know, different groups were figuring out, there's something real here, and it could be really interesting, and it could be really useful. 
so we had a lot of questions. You know, we're the we're the federal we're the group that leads on federal policy for nuclear energy, and we were seeing this wave of innovation coming down the pipeline, and we wanted to know more about it. We wanted to know what are these reactors? Are they real? How far away are they? And um, how much are they going to cost? Are they going to be competitive on the on the levelized cost of electricity? Is there a market in Canada? Is there a market around the world? How big is the market? We wanted to know how are we going to regulate these things? What kind of waste are they going to produce? What are we going to do with the waste? And then we wanted to know what the views of Canadians and also the views of Indigenous people in Canada were. We had these big questions, and that was around 2017, 2018. So in 2018, we convened uh, a process called Canada's SMR Roadmap. And we invited all of the provinces and territories and all of the power utilities um, that were interested in SMRs at the time to join us and to help us do this analysis. Um, and at that time, we had participation from Alberta, Saskatchewan, Ontario, New Brunswick, Nunavut, and Northwest Territories. And that was three, two years ago, two, almost three years ago now. And there was already almost half of the jurisdictions in Canada starting to look at SMRs. Now, this steering group oversaw five expert working groups where we brought in experts from around uh, across the sector. And we were very clear. We were not looking for the vendors, um, the, the ones that are trying to sell SMRs. We, you know, we, we listened to what they had to say, but we were not really, we weren't taking it at face value. We wanted people from the demand side and from the experienced engineering and procurement firms and from the operator's perspective and the regulator's perspective. We wanted to know what the evidence base was. Um, at the end of a 10-month process, so we stood up these expert working groups, and we had workshops across the country and engagement sessions with Indigenous people. And at the end of the process, we, wrote, we summarized a report called Canada's SMR Roadmap. And that report set out what we learned and what we heard about SMRs. And so it was a really good snapshot of where the nation was at on SMRs in 2018. It was released in November of 2018. You can find it still at smrroadmap.ca. Sometimes when you do that kind of a project, you create a lot of buzz and momentum just by doing the project because everybody's working on it, everybody's talking about it. And then you publish your report and the report goes on a shelf somewhere and it kind of dies down and it fizzles out and no one ever talks about it again. Well, nothing could be further from that in the case of SMRs. In 2019, we saw even more momentum uh, in Canada, stakeholders working on this. We saw industry and we saw the operators. And then we saw four of the Canadian uh, premiers of provinces, Alberta, Saskatchewan, Ontario, and New Brunswick, come together with a provincial premier level MOU and um, setting out their intention to collaborate on the development of SMRs. So clearly, it wasn't just um, talk. Something real is happening. And and it's quite clear, not just in Canada, but around the world, that there is a bit of a race to bring this technology, uh, to prove it, to demonstrate it, and to deploy it for the benefit of citizens and for the benefit of the, of the climate. So earlier this year, in 2020, um, NRCAN convened another pan-Canadian process. This time, we're calling it Canada's SMR Action Plan. And it's it's, it's a pan-Canadian initiative. Over 100 organizations have joined us this time, and this time it includes seven provinces and territories. Alberta, Saskatchewan, Ontario, New Brunswick, PEI, the Yukon, and Nunavut, as well as another 100 partners from industry and from research community and universities and civil society and some Indigenous voices as well. So the SMR, the report of the SMR action plan will be a report out to Canadians, a snapshot of where the nation is at on SMRs in 2020. For our listeners uh, right now, if they want to learn more about SMRs or they want to learn more about the action plan, uh, where can they get some of that information? Well, a great place to start is smrroadmap.ca. And a lot of the analysis that we did in 2018 is still relevant today. And when we, when we launch it, you'll be able to go to smraction.plan.ca and see where we're at in 2020. Perfect. Thank you so much, Deanne, for uh, coming and talking to us today. Uh, and I'm sure we'll bring you back for a third episode at some point. Awesome. Thanks, guys.
That was a great interview. I, I always enjoy speaking with Diane. She has like a wealth of knowledge when it comes to nuclear energy. I know she's so well prepared and it's like she knows everything um, about it. So, you know, there seems to be a lot of potential for this new SMR technology. But one of the things I found super interesting was that this is actually, it is a modular unit, you know, like, you know, we build modular homes, but instead of a modular home, this is actually a modular nuclear reactor that can be built in a factory and, and then shipped out to wherever it's needed. Um, so I found that's really super interesting to me. Yeah, that flexibility, right, really gives, uh, it offers up a lot of potential for industry and, you know, remote communities as well. That's really cool. Um, so I guess if, if you, our audience, would like to learn more about these small modular reactors or just nuclear energy in general, uh, make sure to check out the links in the episode description. One of those links will be to our first podcast episode with Deanne, which gives a, like a broader overview of nuclear energy in Canada. If you like this episode, feel free to share it with your friends. And if you share over Twitter, make sure to tag us. Uh, we have at NRCan Science for Simply Science as a whole. Or you can tweet at us directly. I'm at Joel Science. And I'm at Simply Science B. That's the letter B. Now, I'm just going to back up for a second because you mentioned the uh, first po podcast episode with Deanne in the links. And I highly recommend, if you're listening right now, I highly recommend that you go back and you listen to that first podcast as well because it's just full of information. Um, I might also remind everyone that Simply Science has a website and a YouTube channel, which you should check out. We have in-depth articles of interest and videos that showcase the fascinating scientific work that we do at Natural Resources Canada. And you can find those links in the episode description as well. And our social media channels are there too. Thank you, Barb. And thank you so much, everyone, for listening. We'll see you in the next episode. See you then. like this video, let us know with a thumbs up. Click on the logo below to subscribe to the Simply Science channel and click the bell icon to be notified when we upload new videos.